I was raised on a small farm in Australia. Some two and a half thousand sheep, 600 head of beef, and a lot of chores to go around. But I actually enjoyed them. My favourite chore was trimming the old hedge that protected the homestead. It was two storeys high and about a football field long. And I remember when I was 10, I was standing on top, looking over, trimming, mum's in the kitchen, and I was moving from branch to branch. Then all of a sudden, I was falling through the hedge and my landing was soft. Then I realised that I was entangled in the barbed wire fence as the spikes of the car barbed wire carved into my back. I didn't do that chore again. Fifteen years later, I'm in Special Forces and I'm about to start a parachute course that we've all got to do. And for the first part of the training is to do your landings and rolls. So I hop up on the three foot box. Now I know it's only three foot, but it just doesn't feel safe. And I don't want to jump. And all I can see is myself falling through that hedge and those barbed wire spikes. <sighs> the same was true for the 15 foot uh, fan tower and the 100 foot Polish tower. How could this be happening to me? I'm special forces and I'm terrified of heights. I'm so terrified that I devised interesting and special ways of jumping out of a perfectly safe aircraft four times a day, every day, at 12 and a half thousand feet. And one of those was simply <coughs> to sit on the noisy old plane as it gained its height, got higher and higher and it'd get bouncier as it moved through the clouds and it also got colder and colder. And all the time I'd just force a smile. Then, Two minutes out, I'd have to stand up with my combat pack strapped to my leg that weighs a hundred pounds. And I'd shuffle down the back of the plane to the ramp. And on the command, go! I'd jump up into the air and I'd watch the plane fall off in, fly off into the distance. Now I'm falling fairly fast already, but I've got to reach terminal velocity so that I can actually get some stability. Meanwhile, my stomach and its contents are trying to come out my throat. <coughs> my chin strap's whacking me wildly on the side of the face. <laughs> and I've just passed through a cloud and all that rain is now on the outside of my goggles and I can't see a thing. <laughs> Make it worse, I actually started to spin. So I counteracted and spun the other way. Faster and faster and faster. Then everything started to turn grey and that's all I could see as I fell towards Earth at over 160 miles an hour. 9,000 feet, 6,000 feet. I seen my hand coming in to grab my reserve chute and I had to fight centrifugal force to pull the main chute, otherwise I would not survive. 4,000 feet, I'm only 25. <laughs> and I didn't plan to go this way. <coughs> 2,000 feet, all my special forces training kicked in and I managed to pull my chute just in time to set myself up for a very hard landing. <coughs> Oh, I had to hide the pain and I <coughs> pretended to brush off the dirt as I'd search for broken bones. And out of the corner of my eye, I could see Sergeant Dave Quinn. He's my instructor. And he's heading straight for me. Now, Sergeant Quinn is a very hard man and nothing phases him. And yet there he stands as white as a ghost. Spike, we couldn't look. We had to turn away. We all thought you were going to die. <laughs> then he looked me straight in the eye. I knew he was back to normal. And he said, now you know firsthand why each and every day we do those drills until they're perfected, before we even get in the plane. Get on that bus. You've got three more drills to do. <sighs> but that is when I know, knew that safety saves lives, even in the midst of chaos. That near-death experience was 30 years ago, and even with 15 years of Special Forces, I gotta tell you, I'm still scared of heights. That hasn't left me. And also those 15 years of Special Forces has left me with a deep appreciation of the value they placed on life. Unlike a lot of organisations I've trained around the world, they all share one thing, Common sense is not common practice. And people get hurt 
for reasons that just don't make any sense at all. And they don't even train for safety. Safety is dangerous. People are so insulated <coughs> from the dangers of work and life that they have forgotten to use this, so, their risk and safety muscle. They've also taken a view of being reluctant to embrace safety. It costs too much. It's over the top. Or we just haven't got enough time. This thinking is actually dangerous. And then there's so many rules, procedures or meetings that they've got to go to before they even get to work that they just tick the box without any review or verification. And when we tick that box, without review or verification, we're opening the door to the arch enemies of safety. Complacency, ignorance and stupidity. Every year, 2.3 million people die at work through a work-related accident, such as falling from height, being squished by a piece of equipment or livestock, or a disease such as cancer or worker-related asthma. That's one every 15 seconds. That's someone being killed every one 15 seconds. People shouldn't have to go to work to die. And what they don't tell you is in that 15 seconds, there are over 150 other people that get injured. People being killed and injured at work is an issue that affects all of us, our families, our communities. And if we are going to build stronger leaders, safer households, communities, businesses, workplaces, we've got to do something about this crucial issue. Now, safety is dangerous, but it doesn't have to be. There were three critical, mission critical elements in my training that saved my life that we can all put into practice and the world will be a safer place. And the first one is train for stupid. <coughs> Imagine a giant oil rig in the middle of the South China Sea. The company that owned it wanted to improve its production. So it sent out a team with all its equipment and there they sat for four days doing the work. Beautiful sunshine, not a cloud in the sky <coughs> and the sea was as calm as anything to every horizon. So for the last two days they didn't tie down the equipment. One little right wave rolled through the ocean, just gently nudged the rig. Next thing you knew, there was columns of oil erupting into the air. Clouds of explosive gases engulfing the platform. <coughs> the oil that had gone into the air is now starting to come down on the people, the equipment, making it near on impossible for them to escape as the equipment itself started to fall. Then three lone gentlemen left there on the rig were running towards their lifeboat, only to see it drop to the sea and go to safety. They were later saved. However, that all happened simply because someone decided that they didn't have to tie down the equipment when they were supposed to. Those people barely escaped with their lives. The company lost millions of dollars, all because of what I call stupid. Now, many companies have that plaque on the wall. You've seen it, right? You know the one. Safety is our number one priority. <coughs> when safety is a priority, you are taking a bigger risk than if it wasn't. Because priorities change like that. It needs to be a value because when values are instilled, people become proactive. Safety becomes stops being stupid. And people naturally go out of their way to do a better job and safer job. Now, training for stupid is no more than just looking at what could happen and being prepared for it. And you'd be surprised how many companies don't do that. What was the last task you did that you looked at every variable 
before you took on the job. Exactly. We can't leave safety to chance. And the person who does this the most, that most of us would know, is Michael Phelps. His trainer used to flick off the light while he was training and then mess with his goggles so that every variable would be there during his training. And when he came to the Olympics, he would be prepared for it. He won more gold medals than anyone else in the history of the Olympics. Now, we've looked at training for stupid, and it's critical, but you can't leave it there on its own. And if we are going to live safer and fulfilling lives, we need to give safety the respect it actually deserves. And so therefore, the second element is take calculated risks. Now my own kids, I've seen what it was like in the Special Forces to actually take risks all the time. And they were calculated, they were shared, and you could see the development in the, in the soldiers. So I decided to give my children little dad bites of calculated risks. And so they come to me and they go, Dad, can we climb that tree? I go, have you figured out how to get out of it yet? I go, no, and off they go. They come back five minutes later, Dad, have you figured out how to get out of the tree yet? And I go, that's your job. And they go, right, this is how we get up, this is how we get down, and that's the branch we've got to stay off. Sure, go have some fun. And remember, be safe. Then I teach them ninjutsu. And so in the middle of the class, I'd have a big stick and I'd be wheeling it around and they'd be ducking down and they'd be jumping up and they were having the time of their lives. And as long as they were smiling, I would actually go faster and faster and faster. Then you always have in the back of your head, am I doing the right thing? But one Saturday, one, sa one Saturday there we were, we went to a barbecue and all the kids there were about seven and nine. So my kids fitted in really well except there was one boy there who was 12. And he was, you know, he was pushing and prodding and tripping. And so it was the right little pest. So I, I went outside. I went outside to get, give some uh, adult supervision. And just as I was going out <coughs> the door, I could see my son being pushed off the slide all the way down to the ground. And then he did a ninja backward roll, sprang up on his feet and ran away without missing a beat. That's when I knew that I'd actually instilled the right thing into my children. And nowadays, you actually hear it on the radio, and you hear parents talking all the time, oh, we've got to make our kids stretch, and make them develop, and give them their full potential. That's actually true. The thing, the thing is, you've also got to do it to adults. Adults need to be stretched as well. We've got to stop wrapping them in their bubble wrap and have them take risks so they can exercise their safety and risk muscle. What was the last thing you did that you took a risk at? Took a calculated risk at? Because it's not about whether we win or we're successful. It's about the lessons that we learn along the way so that we can use them in later life. A person who actually went through this whole process, most of us know again, <clears throat> went from PayPal, took a giant calculated risk, to SpaceX and Tesla. Elon Musk. Now as we look at the foundations of the three mission critical elements, we've listened to Train for Stupid and we've looked at taking calculated risks. The last one is essential and the third one is let them fail. When I was 24 I was heading out into one of the remotest deserts in Australia. So arid, so barren, that maps are hand-drawn. We were trialling two brand new vehicles, military vehicles, machine guns front and rear, state-of-the-art satellite navigation system, and we just went over halfway and the satellite started talking to the sat-nav system. Beep, 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 beep. And the young officer sitting in the front turned around and said, Spike, what was that? I said, oh, that's the point of no return. Hey, point of no return? Yes, sir, the uh, satellite navigation's worked out that we've only got enough fuel to get back from here where we started, and we haven't got enough for the rest of our mission. Spike, I've been doing this for years. 
I know what I'm doing, and I reckon we've got a, a, a full drum spare. Now, I could actually go, because oh, I had the data right in front of me. Do I let him fail and learn the lesson, or do I fight? So I looked at all the scenarios and went through what could happen, and it went something like this. Food, six months worth, check. Water, one month's worth, check. Ammunition for wild animals, check. Beer, four cans, damn. Medical supplies, enough for a small hospital, check. So then I sat back and watched this lesson unfold. And sure enough, two days later, there we were, sitting on a sand dune, looking at all the other hundreds of sand dunes for miles. It took four days for a special, uh, special forces pathfinder team to actually come in, find us in the first place, then resupply us. Now, that young officer actually went on to be one of the better officers in the unit. And why is that? It's because now his library is starting to fill up with what worked and what didn't work. And when it called upon at the right time, he was able to use it. And if we are going to grow our own leaders for the future, we've got to let them fail as well. When was the last time you let someone you loved, your children, a colleague, fail? Because it's in that failure they learn the lesson, they learn the growth. And where would we be today if Thomas Edison, with all those hundreds of failures, gave up? We wouldn't have the light bulb and we wouldn't have the battery. Now, look, safety is dangerous and lives are at risk and you have a choice. You can be with the status quo or you can put these mission critical elements into your life now for you. Imagine <coughs> if we all, every one of us took or looked at training for stupid in everything we did. And imagine if we took calculated risks in the things we do. That's just who we are. And imagine if we let them fail. That's a world I'd like to live in. So, make safety a value and be safe. Thank you. talked about Michael Phelps, that last Olympics he was in, I guess his goggles during the swim got messed up and got filled with water. So that training of making him swim where he couldn't see, it was that one where he stuck his hand out and beat the guy by a tenth of a second. He was couldn't see when he did that. He just oh. knew instinctively he was at that distance. Did you check and see who joined us? All right, we're going to talk a little bit about hours of service. Uh, DOT, we've had some issues, we want to make sure everyone, we're go, we'll get some information out to everyone, but if you're driving a DOT labeled vehicle or pulling a trailer, you're subject to being inspected, pulled over. A uh, couple things we want to talk about is the hours of service, because we've had some issues with that. First off, you can, there's an 11 hour driving limit in a day. Okay, so the most you can ever drive is 11 hours. The longest you can, if you're driving, is 14 hours. So they give you a 14 hour day. But the thing that's gotten us pinched a couple of times is you can only drive eight hours or work eight hours without a break if you're driving a DOT vehicle. So you have to take a 30 minute break off the clock, i.e. lunch. Now, this could be a little bit of a challenge for field service because Think about it, sometimes those guys will drive three or four hours to a job. How long will they work? We're gonna make sure sales understands they may have to rebid, they may have to factor in staying over on some jobs. If you can only drive a maximum of 14 hours, or have a 14 hour workday with 11 hours driving, if you've got four hours of driving, eight hours of driving round trip for the day, and you spend eight hours working somewhere, you're gonna be over the limit. So we're gonna to have to factor that in. There are detailed duty logs that are required to be kept unless you meet the 100 air mile exemption. So for us, most of our people only drive 
within 100 air miles of where they work out of as a norm. Again, field service, we got, a, we got an exception. So instead of keeping the painful DOT logs that are required, if you have the 100 air mile exemption and only go past that eight days a month, you can keep the hours of service. Uh, we've got some books out. Do you have that picture? Uh, as opposed to the detailed logs. We're, like I said, we're going to get some more information out uh, so everyone has a copy of it. There's also a 60 hour limit in the previous six days. So if you get pulled over, you have, you've got to be able to show them your hours. Now, you can show them, most of you have your time cards and stuff on your cell phone, so you could probably show them the previous week, uh, I believe. Is that true for most of you? Uh, okay. But the book where we're tracking and looking at the uh, when did you come on to work, when did you leave work, is they're requiring a 12-hour off-duty time before you drive. That's the cover of the time record we've sent out to the different branches in the past. And then, can you turn that around? <laughs> that was probably how I sent it. They took it with the cell phone. And it's just time on, time off, but if you're going to be driving a DOT vehicle, you need to track the time you came on to work, if you took a half hour for lunch, off lunch, when you came back on, so that if you get pulled over, we do not run into getting cited for hours of service. If we get too many citations for that, uh, it can affect our ability for DOT. Uh, don't worry about it. But you can see this is a basic one, whereas the detailed ones like the over-the-road truck drivers have to keep, they've got to keep when they're doing other work, when they're in the sleeper cab, when they're at lunch, when they're driving. It's a lot more detailed. It's a pain in the neck to keep. We're looking at this, and Rena's going to have more information coming out, but it looks like we should be able to keep the more basic logs because we don't have people that are driving past the 100 mile exemption and the 100 air miles works out to 115 miles on the ground is what the uh, what it works out to because they factor in it's not a straight line one other thing a lot of people don't realize and again you can just see it's when are you on and off total duty hours and they're looking for the previous days because they want to see that you're not exceeding your 60 hour limit does anybody here know what the fine is if you're operating a cell phone in a DOT vehicle? For the driver. It's 2500 for the driver. The company can get fined 10000 Guess who's going to pay a ticket or a fine if they're violating company policy and federal law and they get a ticket? Company's not going to pay for driver, driver misconduct or... So if you get a ticket and they fine you personally, that is your responsibility for if you're violating, if you're speeding on a cell phone, because uh, we're going to still have to deal with other issues with it on our end. But just keep that in mind. Now, if there's something wrong with the truck on our, we've got a rental truck and the battery wasn't secured on inspection, they, you know, I don't know if there was a fine associated, but they noted that, you know, they cited us for the battery wasn't properly secured. It was on a rental truck. Obviously, that's something we're going we're gonna to pay if there's a fine associated with that. Uh, but if it's your fine because of your misconduct, it's going to be your responsibility. All right. Anybody here that they pass medical marijuana in Missouri? Do you know what that does and how that impacts us? It doesn't. Yeah. Uh, it's like alcohol. So technically it really means nothing for you, but we want to make sure everyone is aware. Our drug policy, you can't have marijuana in your system. You cannot be under the influence of medical marijuana. It is no different than alcohol. You can't come into work under the influence of alcohol. You cannot come to work under the influence of marijuana or medical marijuana. Uh, the reason for this is because safety sensitive jobs, think about it, if you're working in or around equipment, lathes, mills, motors, or you're driving a vehicle, we don't want you under the influence. Uh, 
unlikely based on the way the law is written that anybody who has the type of illnesses that would be oh, that you'd be allowed to have medical <coughs> marijuana would be able to work and but it's it's one of those things you know we just want to make sure we inform you last thing Christmas is coming up how many people do live trees how many people are live tree folks oh none all right if you're live trees whatever you do please make sure you keep them watered daily uh, I know for a few years I did live trees the kids wanted it how much that water disappears how quickly I mean it'll dry out in a heartbeat and it is one of the most flammable items in your house if you let it dry out the other thing I always recommend is if you're leaving the house unplug the lights on the Christmas tree especially with the live tree because again if anything goes wrong if, if a tree gets started I'm telling you that thing will go completely engulfed in a matter of about a minute to a minute and a half and then the house is going to follow that's not a good Christmas time so just if you do live trees please 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 make sure every day somebody is responsible and fills the water at the bottom because it will dry out in a day it'll empty the water at the bottom in a day and it start drying out right away and then once Christmas is done and the wife says it's okay because that's usually get that tree out of the house you know it the longer you have it if you've got it in for a couple of weeks it's already drying out to a certain extent anyhow but uh, it, it, it is a fire hazard all right that's all I've got everyone have a great Christmas and a safe month yes I got one thing. okay that's what I forgot does anyone have anything thank yeah, you we got the lines put in now and so you can't you can't park on the line you can't put pallets on the line you can't drag pallets on the line if you park on it or leave a pallet on it and OSHA came in we get a fine for it it's a pet it's a walkway is how you have to think about it that's where it's safe to walk so don't straddle the forklift on the line or any of that or put pallets on it and if we have let's say guests or visitors that are touring the facility and they do not have steel toed shoes on they must stay between the lines and I don't really care who they are they've got really nice fancy dress shoes I don't care if they're a rep for our biggest supplier of whatever they don't get to leave and go get up close on something all right uh, we had an insure our insurance agent she showed up wasn't thinking she showed up with open-toed shoes you don't get to go out in the shop with those if you wasn't thinking uh, glasses too. yeah well the, the, anybody on tour needs to be wearing glasses also if you're sitting in a blue chair please take them back out put them around the table out there that's all I got everyone have a safe week a safe month and a wonderful Christmas <laughs>